Well, hello everyone and welcome to uh, Unit 4 of our Kingdom Leadership uh, Training and Mentoring. And once again, super excited to have you with us today and uh, well done for persevering. For those of you who have been studying your manuals and doing the exercises and committing yourself to grow, remember, growth in this leadership gift gives an amazing return on investment, not just in church leadership, but in your family, in your own life, in your business, and wherever God can use you. So let me encourage you to keep going, keep growing, and I really pray that you'll start seeing the fruit of that in your life. Now, once again, before we dive into today's lesson, just a quick reminder of the three big objectives that we have for this course. Number one, to be trained in biblical leadership. And I really pray that these principles and teachings of God's Word from this manual that Dudley Daniel uh, produced for us, I pray that this teaching would be going deep into your heart, not just as information, but rather revelation, because it's revelation that brings about transformation in our lives. So that's objective number one. Objective number two is I'm super passionate about trying to encourage you to put a leadership growth plan in place in your life. Remember, leaders are not produced in a day, but daily. It's the little habits in your daily lifestyle that over the years will grow and compound and produce remarkable change. So I've spoken about a couple of aspects towards a growth growth, <laughs> growth plan that I would encourage your life. And number one, we spoke about books. And I hope by now you've got, uh, whether it's this manual or one of the books I recommended, I hope you're devoting a little bit of time, ideally every day, towards reading, marking up that book, and hopefully it's leaving its mark on you as well. What I want to talk about very briefly is podcasts. We are so, so privileged nowadays through the internet to have free access to some of the greatest leaders and preachers and teachers right around the world. Really, it is such an incredible resource that we have available to us. Now, podcasts, for those of you who don't know, are simply teachings that are available and you can download them on onto your phone, onto your tablet, onto your laptop. But I would really recommend if you're someone who does uh, some traveling, in other words, if you drive to work or if you spend time in the car, those are crucial moments. If you're a leader called of God and yet you sit in your car and listen to the radio, then I want to challenge you right now. These are precious moments that can be used for your leadership and spiritual growth. So here's a couple. I want to mention just three of the podcasts. Podcasts, uh, you can download them using a little app on your phone. As I said, they're all free, or most of them are certainly free, the ones I listen to. And if you subscribe to them, then automatically they can be downloaded on your phone so that by the time you sit in your car, you can plug it into your radio system or Bluetooth it, whatever you do, and you can listen to their teachings. So the three of them that I want to mention, number one, and each of these from your podcast app, you can put into the search and uh, it'll take you straight to them, is number one, John Maxwell's Leadership Podcast. This is a weekly teaching where uh, either they do a candid conversation with him where he will talk about leadership and what he's currently involved in, or they'll play one of his teachings that he's done in the past, and then some of his colleagues will pull it apart, dissect it, and apply it to their lives. I highly recommend it. Uh, John Maxwell was a pastor for 20 years before focusing exclusively on leadership leadership development, and uh, I believe he's got a lot of wisdom. Certainly, I enjoy and grow from that. Number two, Craig Grishel's Leadership Podcast, one of the most uh, popular leadership podcasts in the world. It's got a uh, huge number of subscribers. Craig uh, Grishel leads Life Church, that big church across in the United States. And uh, once again, he's, he's an incredible leader with an amazing leadership gift. He will interview different leaders and he will teach. It's 20 minutes once a month, but packed full of great content. And I'd recommend that one as well. And then number three, I like to listen to the Global Leadership Network podcast as well. That also comes out once a week and uh, features different uh, leaders giving interviews. It's Christian based and uh, it's been it's wonderful opportunity to be exposed to other leaders around the world. Some of them spiritual leaders, some of them in the secular world, but we can learn a lot from them. So here's the encouragement to make that adjustment so that uh, for me, every time I'm in the car, whether I'm driving to church and back, whether I'm heading down to Durban or something, that's something I do once or twice a month. These are great moments to sit in the car and invest in my leadership growth. Maybe for you it's washing dishes, maybe it's hanging washing, whatever it is. If you can carve out that time, don't waste it, but rather use 
uh, that time to invest in your leadership. So hopefully your leadership growth uh, plan is coming together in your life. And then remember the third part about it as well was to learn how to be mentored. The art of asking good questions and drawing from those questions and applying them to your life. And that's why I hope that uh, you'll be joining us for the Q&A after this. If you're doing this with your pastor or by yourself, I pray that you will learn the art of taking the questions, things inside of you, writing them down and then finding the right people to ask questions and to draw knowledge out of them. So having said all of that, let's dive into today's content. Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to spend time together in your word, learning and growing together and we just commit this next time into your hands we're asking Holy Spirit for your teaching for your leading thank you Father that it's you who takes information and turns it into revelation in our hearts and I pray that you would come and do that right now in Jesus name Amen. Alrighty, we are on page 46 of the manual and the title of today unit 4 is called maturity in leadership and uh, this is an amazingly important topic because really leaders in the kingdom of God are those sons and daughters, saints of God who have matured in their faith. Now, when you hear maturity, some people think about, well, older age. I'm not talking about that as well. I've been a pastor long enough to know that just because someone's been a Christian for years after year after year does not make them mature. In fact, some young people passionate for Jesus have uh, surpassed others who've been Christian for years because of their hunger and dedication to grow in the things of God. So maturity is not about age. Maturity is about how much of Christ has been formed in us. Now, remember, Jesus gave gifts to the church for this exact reason. I'll read from uh, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 13, where it speaks about the gifts, apostles, prophets, pastors, evangelists, teachers given to the church. Why? Wow. Verse 13 says this will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. God's desire is for maturity, mature sons and daughters who would bring glory and honor to Him. Maturity is a big thing to God. So section 4, 4.1, Christian maturity. And really what I want to focus, once again, there's way too much material. I'm not going to get through all of this or even try and get through all of it, I want to zero in on specifically these six distinctives of what Christian leadership and maturity look like compared to a worldly based leadership. Now, this is important because leadership is, is something spoken about in the world, in business, but Jesus drew a very clear distinctive between what leadership looks like in the world versus leadership in the kingdom. And I love to learn from uh, other leaders. I love to read other books and I think we can glean some experience. But there are some essential differences between kingdom leadership and leadership in the world. And if we're going to mature as sons and daughters leading in the kingdom, we have to understand it. That's why for me, this is a critical section. I want to look at these six points and uh, I'm really praying that they're going to go deep into our hearts. So let's dive in. As I said, page number 46, 4.1.1, before actually considering the qualities that should characterize mature Christians and Christian leadership, it would be well to consider its uniqueness. It's hoped that in doing so, it will focus us on the supernatural element involved and how Christian maturity and leadership is to find its source in a personal relationship with the living Christ through the Holy Spirit and in the light of the special revelation of God, the Holy Bible. Yikes, big sentence, but I love that. The uniqueness of Christian leadership and the supernatural component and element that goes with it. And that's what we're yearning for. Our God is a God of fruitfulness. God is looking for fruitfulness. God is glorified through fruitfulness, but we can only be fruitful in our ministry and in our leadership through dependence on the Holy Spirit, working with the Holy Spirit. And that's what makes Christian maturity and leadership unique. I love that to find its source in a personal relationship with the living Christ. Now, this is an amazing thing. We're going to focus on it in a moment. Jesus, we recognize as the greatest ever leader. Yet, let me tell you this. Jesus was such a great leader because he was the greatest follower. 
Jesus himself said, I can do nothing by myself, but I only do what I see my father doing. I only say what I hear my father saying. I only judge the judgments the father has given me. In other words, everything Jesus did was in complete dependence on the Holy Spirit as he walked in step with his father. So Jesus, the greatest leader, was actually the greatest follower. That's what makes Christian maturity and leadership so unique. We become more mature by becoming more dependent upon the Holy Spirit. Our leadership grows, our capacity grows as we become more dependent on the Holy Spirit, more of Him and less of us, as John the Baptist said. So that's what we're going to be focusing on. So the following is a summary of six distinctives. Distinctive number one, Christian maturity and leadership is distinct because of the nature of a leader's position as a servant as opposed to the viewpoint of the secular world. This is absolutely critical, and I'm sure, and I hope you've heard it many times, but if I can use my fingers as a, as a quick analogy, if you can imagine a little triangle, no, it's not my heart, this is a triangle right here. Many of the pictures of the world would put the leader at the top, at the top of the pile, something like a, a king where, where he's on top and everyone needs to serve him. The hierarchical model of, uh, and that gets into our thinking where, where the leader's at the top, he's the most important, he's the most valuable, and everyone is there to serve him. Now, this is traditionally the view that the world has of leadership. Now, remember, of course, what Jesus said. We'll read it again in a moment. You know how the world leads and how rulers dictate and lord it over their people. And Jesus said, it is not going to be like that with you. Rather, in the kingdom of God, there's a switch that's taken place. Now, we don't become the servant of all the people. We're servants of God. But there's that element of being a servant-hearted leader. We serve people because we're serving Christ. So let's have a look at a couple of these scriptures and then some of the comments. In Luke chapter 22... Luke chapter 22, verses 24 to 27. Luke 22, verse number 24. It says, Then, this is his disciples, they began to argue among themselves about who would be the greatest among them. Let's stop there for a moment. Sometimes you read this and you think, Really? I mean, can you imagine Jesus' disciples actually walking on the road and Peter saying, Guys, I think I'm probably a bit greater than you. I think Jesus loves me more than you. And I mean, we think, Oh, that's so childish and ridiculous. Let me tell you. We can do the same thing, but in different ways. I've been a pastor long enough to know that when you meet a bunch of pastors within the, the first couple of moments, it's, uh, so uh, how, how big is your church? <laughs> and really what they're saying is exactly that. They're trying to establish a pecking order. You know, who's the, who's the greatest? Who's got the biggest church? Who's got the most money? Who's got this, 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 this? What, what was happening here happens in our hearts. It's just as real and relevant. So verse 25, Jesus told them, In this world the kings and great men lorded over their people, yet they called friends of the people. It's crazy. We have a similar thing in the world. We have a, a civil servant, someone who works for the government. He's a civil servant, but there's sometimes no serving in them. It's going to be about position, title, and privilege. We need to turn this around, is what Jesus is saying. But among you, it will be different. Those who are the greatest among you should take the lowest rank and the leader should be like a servant. Who is more important, the one who sits at the table or the one who serves? The one who sits at the table, of course, but not here. For I am among you as one who serves. I love that. Let's uh, jump across to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10 and verse, I'm going to jump to verse 42 rather. Verse 42 to 45. So Jesus called together his 12 disciples and he said, You know that the rulers in this world lorded over their people and the officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you, it will be different. Don't you love that? I want to speak with the authority of Christ right now. And I want to speak to every single one of us in the words of Jesus. And Jesus said, But among you, it will be different. Jesus is saying, I do not want you to lead like the world leads. We have a different model of leadership, a different philosophy, a different faith behind our leadership amongst the kingdom of God, the sons and daughters in the kingdom of God. It will be different. Um, 
It says, carries on in verse 40 through, whoever wants to be a leader among you. And notice Jesus doesn't say it's a bad thing. Remember that. It's a great calling to be a leader. Jesus is looking for, we should be as sons and daughters of God. We should be walking in leadership. It's not a bad thing to aspire to leadership. All Jesus did was change the roadmap. In other words, it's great to want to be a leader, but let me tell you how to get there. You don't get there by climbing on top of people to get to the top. Rather, he says, whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you, when the Bible speaks about first, it speaks about the captain of the team. Uh, It said uh, first Peter, and then it carried on. First apostles, and then the other gifts. Not because they're more important, but because they've got a distinctive role. A captain of the team is part of the team, but he's responsible for decisions to be made in the team. Whoever wants to be first among you must be the slave of everyone else. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. It's beautiful. This is Jesus teaching on leadership. Regardless of one's position in the home or the church, the biblical principle is that there is only one who is number one. And that's not you and me. That's not the husband. No, no. The number one. That's not the lead elder. The number one is Jesus Christ. He is the head of his church and his people. And that is Christ himself. It is he who is to be preeminent. That is above all things. And in the life of the church, submission to Christ's authority and leadership is one of the hallmarks of leadership. Let me say that again. Submission to the lordship and authority of Christ is one of the hallmarks of leadership. And let me say maturity. That's what maturity looks like. As we mature, we don't become more independent. We become more submitted to the authority and lordship of Christ. Until just like Jesus, we can say, I can do nothing by myself. It's beautiful, isn't it? That's why this is crucial. Distinctive number one of kingdom leadership is that we are servants. Servants of God worked out in serving people. All right, let's jump to uh, distinctive number two. And Christian maturity and leadership is distinct because of the nature of its character requirements. Character is crucial in the kingdom of God. Now, in the world, in a secular environment, productivity is king. Doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter what you do wrong, as long as you produce, as long as you get the results, the end justifies the means. Not so in the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of God, it is our lives that are leading. And that's why character is a crucial thing. In the kingdom of God, it's built on trust. We call to trust one another. We call as leaders to build trust with our people, which makes character indispensable. While the secular and corporate world may speak of the need of moral character, it will lack certain qualities of character that are strictly Christian in nature, like submission to the authority of Christ complete trust in the tenets or the ways of scripture and those characteristics listed in 1 Timothy 3, 2 to 7. Now, I'm sure you've read that list many times, but let me read it again with the emphasis now on uh, Paul is describing, remember, these crucial ingredients to eldership, to leadership in the church. But I want you to hear the reality is this is not skills that he's looking for. He's looking for Christian character. So let me read from verse number one. This is a trustworthy saying. If someone aspires to be a church leader or elder, he desires an honorable position. So a church leader must. Did you hear that word? Must. This is not an optional extra. This is crucial. Must be a man whose life is above reproach. He must be faithful to his wife. He must exercise self-control, live wisely, and have a good reputation. He must enjoy having guests in his home and he must be able to teach he must not be a heavy drinker or be violent he must be gentle not quarrelsome and not love money he must manage his own family well having children who respect and obey him for if a man cannot manage his own household how can he take care of God's church wow it's an incredible list and almost impossible and it is impossible without submission to the Holy Spirit now Once again, when we read lists like that, it's so easy to get discouraged and think, oh, I could never measure up to that. And here's the truth. None of us can measure up to that except in full submission 
to the Holy Spirit. You see, my friends, all this is, this is a list of character uh, results and actions that stem from the fruit of the Holy Spirit in our lives. When the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, helpfulness, self-control, when that is the fruit, these will be the actions. So if we just aim for the actions without the Holy Spirit fruit, we're always going to fall short. But rather, that's why this, instead of being a checklist to try and aim for, rather, this is simply describing what Christian maturity should look like in every single saint, and in particular, those called to eldership. So uh, the characteristics listed in 1 Timothy 3, 2-7 and Titus 1, 7-9, not a list of rules, but rather the fruit of maturity. So that's distinctive number two, the importance of character in the kingdom of God. Distinctive number three, Christian maturity and leadership is distinct as to its source. Now, this is huge. The source, where does that leadership come from? Where does the character come from? It doesn't come from us, but supernaturally comes by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Scripture, the special ability to be a Christian leader is explicitly declared to be the product of the gift of the Spirit. While all Christians have a responsibility to lead in certain capacity, as parents, uh, sometimes on Sundays, through Sunday school teaching, through uh, their basic example of their lives, to be a light and to be salt into the world, as as members of society, the Holy Spirit, the giver of spiritual gifts, 1 Corinthians 12 verse 7, it says, but to each one, the manifestation or the gift of the Spirit has been given for the common good. But he gives a special gift of leadership described in Romans 12. Now, let's go and have a look at that. Romans chapter 12 verses 6 to 8. It says, in his grace, God has given different gifts for doing things well. These are grace gifts. Now, grace, in its simplest form, I always remember, grace is simply God's help. It's God's supernatural enabling power. It's His help. Now, He puts grace into each one of us, and one of those graces is the grace of leadership. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you're a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it's giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. Isn't that beautiful? And the reason you are watching or listening to this teaching is because you're doing this. You've recognized there's a grace inside of you that's, that's put, that makes you aspire to want to grow in your leadership and you're taking it seriously. Well done for following these teachings. Well done for investing in your leadership growth. Well done for putting a leadership growth plan in place. Well done for learning to ask questions so that you can draw the experience out of others. Take that leadership gift seriously. So the source of our leadership is not us. It's the gift that God has given. Now remember, when Jesus gives gifts to us, He's going to hold us accountable one day for what we've done with it. Remember the parable of uh, the talents? And one was given five, one, three, one, one. And then when the master returned, the one with five said, Look, I've taken the five, I've made five more. And God said, Well, or the judge said, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a little I will give you even more. Same thing. You've been given a leadership gift. The question is, what are you going to do with it? Are you going to lie, let it lie dormant? Are you going to use it just for your own personal gain? Now think about that for a moment. You see, God gives you grace. You can use that grace gift for His glory or for selfish gain. Now, some of you might be great business leaders. And you might think, let me trade carefully here, you might think you're an amazing businessman. Reality is, God has given you grace to lead. Now my question is, are you using that leadership gift exclusively for selfish gain, or are you letting it be harnessed for the kingdom of God? Of course you can use it in business, but are you using it to glorify God? God is the source of of these leadership gifts. Now, distinctive number four, Christian maturity and leadership is distinct as to its enabling. I love this. The Christian character required to be a godly leader, biblically speaking, has its source in a personal abiding relationship with Jesus Christ. It is to be the product of a spirit full, I mean, a word full, spirit full, or controlled life. This is huge. This is huge. In fact, maturity 
simply means we go deeper and deeper. We allow more and more of our heart to be transformed, to be in submission, to be led by the Holy Spirit. And that's the secret to fruitfulness. Colossians 3 verse 16. Colossians 3 verse 16. It says, let the message about Christ in all its richness fill your lives, fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom he gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. In other words, be full of the Holy Spirit. What's the greatest thing we could grow, do to grow our capacity as leaders? Be more full of the Holy Spirit than what you used to. Maybe you've got a, a normal, this is kind of what it feels to be full of the Holy Spirit. I say, Lord, Double it. Lord, double it. We want to be overflowing with the fullness of the Holy Spirit because out of that, the gifts of leadership will flourish. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18. Ephesians 5 verse number 18. It says, don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. That analogy, I mean, how do you get drunk with wine? Well, you sit in the bar and all day long you just drink and drink and drink. And eventually you're going to stagger out of there. Your behavior is going to be influenced because of all the spirit you have been drinking. Now, Paul's using the same analogy. Don't get drunk on wine. That's going to ruin your life. Rather, in the same way, let your life be filled and filled and filled. Holy Spirit, more of you, more surrender to you, more faith in you. Let your word fill my heart. And the more the Holy Spirit fills us, the more our behavior is influenced by the power of the Holy Spirit. So it results in the life changed by Christ. So this is the enabling that happens. This is what makes Christian leadership distinct from worldly leadership. We have the power of the Holy Spirit at work in us and we can learn to walk with him. So distinctive number five, Christian maturity and leadership is distinctive as to its ambition and motivation. In other words, the big why. Why do you want to be a leader? Why are we called to leadership? An ambition is a strong desire to accomplish something or reach a specific goal. The difference between a worldly or godly ambition is the nature of the ambition and the motives behind the ambition. 1 Timothy 3 verse 1. Remember we read that a little while ago. And uh, in the NLT it says, and this is a trustworthy saying, if someone aspires to be a church leader, he desires an honorable position. The old NRV used to say, uh, despise a noble task. There's something noble. There's something honorable. This is the distinction of Christian leadership. Patrick Lencioni, I mentioned it uh, when I recommended one of the books about the motive. Why are you leading? It says there's two primary motives behind our leadership. One is reward and one is responsibility. The question is, why are you leading? If you're leading because surely leaders have greater privilege, surely leaders get more respect, they get the limelight. If you're leading because of reward, that's not good enough. That's not going to produce the mature leaders that God is looking for. The only reason that we lead is because God has called us. There's that sense of calling, like Paul said, I'm compelled, the love of Christ compels me. There's that sense of responsibility that comes from the call of God. It's a sense of how do I serve? How do I love people? I love them with my leadership gift. Motivation is crucial, the why behind our leadership. The desire to be a leader is defined as a fine work or an honorable position or a noble task. This takes the focus off the idea of position and places it on the function or responsibility that goes with the job. But as noble as it may be, if one's motives are wrong, then the ambition becomes tainted and wrong. Selfish motives that do not truly spring from spirit-produced love lead to some of the most destructive behaviors in the body of Christ. Whew. And if you've been in leadership a while, you'll know that this is true. Dudley Daniel, one of the things he always used to say to leaders is, leaders, you need to be part of the solution and not part of the problem. And sadly, the biggest problems in churches result not from the people in the church, but from the leaders in the church. Because the leaders carry influence and profile, people have a higher expectation because we call to imitate the faith of our leaders. And so when leaders are leading with the wrong motives, eventually it's going to come out through their behavior and that causes damage. 
So thus, a true mark of maturity that is needed in Christian leaders is purity of motives, as is modeled for us in the life and ministry of Paul and his associates. Now, because God loves us so much, and he does love us so much, God will allow certain tests along the way to test the real motives of your leadership. I shared a few stories a couple of episodes back about this passion I had inside of me to, to, to come into uh, eldership, to be on full-time ministry. I was working as an engineer. And then uh, that day, the story I told, Memo, in uh, the pastor came to me and said, yes, it's time that we release an elder in the church. And I'm glowing on the inside thinking, yes, Lord, this is my moment. And he asked me, so what do you think about this other guy in the church? And I just felt the whole world just collapse in front of me right there. And I remember on the outside smiling, hmm, that's a great idea. On the inside, I was dying a thousand deaths. But let me tell you, that was the test. The, the flesh inside of me wanted to sulk, find a reason to leave the church, get miffed, climb the miffed tree, build the treehouse, the whole works. But the reality is God allows these tests along the way. The tests of being overlooked, the test of other people being uh, recognized and being promoted, the test of opposition, of a potential offense. All of these things will happen in our lives. I'm not trying to be a prophet of doom, but rather God is sifting the motives of our heart. If you do what you do because you love Jesus, then you'll keep doing it. If you do what you do because of your desire for success or recognition or to be a people pleaser, then you will get offended, miffed. Leaders, we call to be part of the solution and not part of the problem. Alrighty, distinctive number six then, Christian maturity and leadership is distinctive as to its authority. A Christian leader's authority comes from Christ, but it is his responsibility as a leader. He is a servant in a twofold way. Number one, he's a servant of Christ and operates under the authority and leadership of Christ. This is huge. We are under Christ. Remember the centurion when Jesus was asked to go and heal his, uh, his servant and the centurion said, I know what it is to be in authority. I have superiors over me who tell me what to do. I've got soldiers under me. I tell them what to do. Jesus, you just say the word and my servant will be healed. And Jesus was amazed. He said, I haven't seen such great faith in all of Israel. In other words, it's a sign of faith to be able to come under authority so that we can exercise authority. And then number two, the Christian leader is to function as a servant to those he leads. I love this verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse number 5. It says, you see, we don't go around preaching about ourselves. We preach that Jesus Christ is Lord and we ourselves are your servants for Jesus' sake. That's a beautiful statement right there. We are your servants for Jesus' sake. We're not your servants for your sake. In other words, people are not our master. That's so important. We servants of people for Jesus' sake. In other words, we serve people, but Jesus is our master. If you get that wrong, we can become a people pleaser where we never exercise government because all we want to do is serve the people and keep the people happy. That means the people have become your master. No. To be a servant leader in the kingdom of God means, yes, we serve people because Jesus is our master. That is critical. So in the context of our, the nature of Christian maturity and the distinctiveness of Christian leadership, certain qualities have been briefly touched on, like the leader as a model, the source of enablement and the servant concept. Now a more detailed discussion will follow concerning the marks of spiritual maturity, which are naturally also the marks or, or characteristics of Christian leadership. Now, we're not going to get through uh, all of those. In fact, all I want to do for the next, uh, I think we've got about five minutes left, is just look at a couple of these scriptures and I want to wrap it up with just some practical. How do we mature? We've been talking about maturity, Christian leadership maturity. How do we mature? And I want to mention just four things that come out of these passages at the bottom of page 48. 4.2, biblical characteristics of maturity. Important scriptures to keep in mind. Number one, let's go to the book of James. James chapter 1, and I'm going to read from verse 2 to 4. It says, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider an opportunity for great joy. Isn't that crazy? 
When troubles come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Some of the old translation speaks about considering it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. For the testing of your faith develops perseverance. And perseverance must finish its work so that you will be mature and complete. So where does maturity come from? Maturity comes from perseverance. Mature people know how to keep going even when they face opposition. Mature people are not dominated and controlled by their emotions, but rather by calling and by conviction. A sign of maturity is the ability through trials and difficulties to hold the course and keep on going. So number one, how do we mature? We mature through our attitude to trials. Now, let's put this in perspective. Right now, this is being recorded during the lockdown of 2020. This is a time where we need to persevere. Economically, it's been tough. We're seeing um, people catching this virus, and it is a difficult time. This is a moment for maturity. Your attitude in trials is going to develop and determine your level of maturity. James says, consider it pure joy, because you understand that God is maturing us in the fire. I hope that makes sense. It's a big one. The heading we have put here, how do we mature? Number one, we mature through our attitude to trials. Number two, Ephesians 4. We started with a scripture. Ephesians 4, let me read from 12 to 15. It says there, remember the apostles and prophets, it says their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and the knowledge of God's son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. In other words, God gives gifts to equip and train people for works of ministry so that when people begin to do what God's called them to do, they begin to mature. In other words, maturity comes through involvement and actually participating and doing. We can only grow to a certain level by receiving. But to go from receiving to giving in serving mode, that's when maturity begins to happen. So how do we mature? Mature number two, we mature through serving, through serving, through using our gifts, using our ministry, fulfilling our calling, and going from receiving mode into serving mode. Number three, how do we mature? Let's go to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 6, and I'm going to read from verse 1 to 3. It says, so let us stop going over the basic teachings about Christ again and again. Let us go on instead and become mature in our understanding. Surely we don't need to start again with the fundamental importance of repentance from evil deeds, placing our faith in God. You don't need further instructions about baptism, laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, eternal judgment. And so God willing, we will move forward to further understanding. How do we mature? Number three, through your spiritual diet. I want to ask you, are you still just drinking the milk of the word? Now, I'm delighted. I'm preaching to the choir right now because here you are tucking into a thick, juicy leadership manual going deeper. And I'm delighted about that. The reality is so many Christians are still living on a little milk of the word. It's time to go deeper. It's time to study God's word for ourselves, not as living on another preacher's revelation, but finding revelation for ourselves, learning to study God's word, learning to read a bit deeper, learning to prepare ourselves in the word. Your diet is going to determine your maturity. Mature people eat steak. Babies drink milk. My question for you is what is your spiritual diet? Are you going on to maturity? And lastly, let me wrap up with this one. If we back it up a couple of verses to chapter 5, and I'm going to read from verses 11 and 12. It says, There is so much more we would like to say about this, but it's difficult to explain, especially since you are spiritually dull and don't seem to listen. You've been believers so long that by now you ought to be teaching others. Instead, you need someone to teach you again the basic things about the Word. You're like babies who need milk and cannot eat solid food. Yikes, that's a hectic one. But let's let's cut to the chase. The reason the writer of Hebrews is saying you're still immature because you are dull. 
dull. Now, dullness of heart or hardness of heart is the result of undealt with sin issues inside of us. This is huge. Another Dudley Daniel uh, little quote was to learn to be radical in dealing with sin. You see, when our hearts ah, try and manage sin and play with sin and hold on, all that happens is a dullness comes to our heart. And that dullness stops us truly being able to go deeper. So point number four, how do we mature? Through deeper surrender. Deeper surrender. A full yielding to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Radical repentance will soften our hearts so that we can mature more. Sure, we've covered a whole lot and uh, really the two things we've focused on, the distinctives, what is it about kingdom leadership that is different to the world, its source, its position, why we lead, and then how do we mature? And for me, this is crucial, that deeper surrender, that going into a greater diet, that coming from receiving mode, going into giving and serving mode, we call to mature in Christ. My friends, I pray that uh, this lesson would have been helpful. I pray that God would continue to mature you. I pray that uh, your leadership gift inside of you would grow stronger and stronger as you continue to invest in it. May God bless you. Can't wait to see you again next week. God bless everyone. Bye for now.